Okay, so today in the, in the Journal Club, we're going to talk about a paper from 1893 by a fellow by the name of William Coley, who became famous for trying to treat cancer patients with Coley's toxins. Um, and the title of the paper is The Treatment of Malignant Tumors uh, by Repeated Inoculations of Erysipelas with a Report of 10 Original Cases. And it was published in the American Journal of the Medical Sciences uh, in 1893. And it, just to give you some background on William Coley, uh, it's sort of interesting to me anyway. He, he went to Yale for his undergrad years, and then he went to Harvard Medical School and graduated in uh, 1888 at the age of 26. And then he came to went to New York, where he interned in resident, uh, was intern and resident uh, at New York Hospital, which is my hospital. And, um, and he only for two years. And then he set up practice in New York City and practicing out of New York Hospital as well as some other ones in 1890 uh, at the age of 28. And actually, this is a, this is William Coley right behind my, my shoulder here. And that's a portrait that I did a couple of years ago where I took a uh, photo of him off the web when he was a young man rather than, you know, so many of the portraits are done of famous people when they're old geezers. And they have their white hair and beards and all kinds of things. <laughs> and they, look, they all look like Methuselah. And so I... I I've objected to that throughout my career. So whenever I do a portrait of, of, you know, one of the famous types, I try to find them one when they were young, or at least at the height of their celebrity. So this is this is uh, William Coley when about 1890, and he he published a paper, his first paper in 1891. Not bad for a young buck. Um, and in, in that paper, he started to he included three of his cases that he treated. Uh, patients with um, what, what was what was called erysipelas, and there still is such a thing as erysipelas. That word means that you have a, a red hot uh, inf area of your skin. It's a superficial infection of your skin. And um, he goes into, the, in, into some of his publications in terms of what motivated him to get into this area. And of course, as we've just gone through Louis Pasteur um, and then Robert Koch and and so forth. Everybody around, you know, 1870, 1890, 80 and 90. I mean, this was the heyday of bacteriology and there were new discoveries being made right and left uh, of new bugs and so forth. But there was a, one of his first patients when he had set up practice in New York was a young woman of only, only 26 years old. And she came into him with a, with a nodule on her hand. And it turns out that um, there was a long story and several different biopsies and so forth. But she had a she had a uh, a nodule on 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 the dorsal aspect aspect of her hand, and it turned out it was bone cancer or osteosarcoma, and um, it, it was he took the case to the rest of the doctors at the hospital, and it was recommended that they do an amputation uh, at uh, in her of her arm and hand, and about sort of mid midway through the lower arm, which he did, and um, but. She came back about a month after that operation and she had nodules um, on her chest. And basically um, she, she first presented to him in July and by January she was dead, you know, disseminated cancer and so forth. And it really, this one case shook this guy up and he, um, he, he, he thought this is terrible. And he went to the literature or he, he went to the case records of the New York hospital and he went through 90 cases of osteosarcoma and he wanted to find out what the, what the, the cure rate or survival rate uh, of this disease with, with just surgery, treated by just surgery alone. And he found out that basically um, there was about a 30% long-term survival rate, five-year survival rate with surgery alone, which meant that 70% of the cases were already inoperable, even though they looked like they were operable because they already had metastatic disease at the time that they, the operation was done. And of course, because so many of these different, these osteosarcoma and other sarcomas of, sarcoma is a, is a word for cancers of the, of the soft tissues really. Whereas carcinoma is a is a uh, is a word that's used for the the surface and the of the body with skin and so forth, and then on the in, internal aspect of the, the the endothelium, the epithelium and the endothelium. When that becomes cancerous, you get they call it carcinoma. Anyway, 
Coley thought to himself, there's got to be a better way. You know, this is not all of my fancy surgical techniques that I learned in medical school and beyond in residency. They're not, not going to do very much for, for these poor patients. And one of the things that he mentions in, in, in this paper from 1893 well, he, he references a paper that he published in 1891, where he reviewed three cases. But there was also a fellow uh, in Germany who, had been, who was a, a bacteriologist working with Robert Koch, of Robert Koch fame. Um, and in 1883, he uh, had isolated for the first time um, the streptococcal pyogenes bacteria. And, and cultured it and purified it and, and, and showed the world and reported to the world that this is, this is what's causing these um, uh, infections that we've been calling causing erysipelas if it's on the surface of the skin and cellulitis if it's, if it's deeper into the tissues, um, subcutaneous or and or um, into the um, muscle and, and other kinds of things. And basically Streptococcus pyogenes is a, a causes a um, severe infection and it can be fatal. And of course, penicillin is, is, was a, the wonder drug that came along that really, really wiped out um, strep, strep infections and made the doctor's lives easier. But for the most part, if you just had a surface infection with um, streptococcus, you, you could recover on your own. You know, there's this, this thing called the immune system that would work on you in your favor. But what um, the fellow's name in um, in Germany was um, Felicen, Frederick Felicen, who um, isolated the bug. And Felicen really is the first guy that tried to use streptococci uh, experimentally. And in the 1880s, he treated um, five to seven cases uh, of patients with with um, sarcomas, bone cancers, osteosarcoma, and so forth. And, um, and he said that he really had, um, he treated seven patients and two patients were cured. And one of the patients, other patients had greater than a 50% reduction in the tumor size. And so in, in um, Coley's paper of 1891, he mentions that and he references Felicen's paper. So he knew about this and he wasn't the first then. He's now, nowadays in 2021, he's called the grandfather of immunotherapy. So that's why we read his paper rather than Felicen's paper, which were published in German. And I don't think they exist in English um, uh, today. So because of, you know, back to, that I discussed earlier in, in our journal club. In 1893, the, the 1893 paper, Coley, uh, presents 10 cases of his own that he treated with um, uh, injections into the tumor mass of um, streptococcal organisms, live streptococcal. This wasn't a dead treatment of any, any you know. And, and so he, and, and he, in his process of going through these 10 cases, I'll just mention some of the things. It's an interesting uh, paper because it's 25 pages long in this American Journal of the Medical Sciences. And it's similar to um, Jenner's paper of 1798 where basically the, the, these were the, the clinical guys and they were different from the scientists and because what they had, what their sort of lab bench was were, were the patients in the hospital. And so they, what they, so in order to report um, on, on them, they, you, they give you case reports. And, and so what, what Coley did in this paper was give you abbreviated case reports of, of these first 10 patients that he treated after 1891 uh, and, and published in 1893. And the, the, the first patient was really his, his um, which hooked, got him hooked essentially. He was a 35 year old person, man with a sarcoma of the head and neck and big tumors, you, can, <clears throat> you didn't need a microscope. So Coley got um, cultures of, of, the, um, of the streptococci straight from Koch, Robert Koch's group in, in uh, Germany. And he injected the, the, these um, tumors repeatedly every two or three days. With these injections, particularly the first injection, <clears throat> patient got a fever of 105 degrees 
and um, got an inflammation, erysipelas on, on his, these tumors in his face and so forth. But the good news was, is that he, he after repeated injections, um, the tumor shrank and shrank and shrank, and uh, they ultimately they disappeared. So he went into complete remission and the time of the writing of the paper, he, he'd been uh, disease free for, for two years. And so Coley was treating only inoperable cases. He wasn't treated any of the cases that looked like you could, you know, uh, get rid of it with surgery alone. So, and the, the survival rate was zero in, in an inoperable cases. So they, all, they all went on to die. So, so this fellow basically was cured. And then um, uh, cases number two and three, um, there was a, a temporary reduction. He treated them the same way. Temporary reduction in, in the size of the tumor mass, but they, but they essentially grew back. So they were, they were not complete remissions. Um, case number four was a large carcinoma on the face and there was no response. But there also was no high fever in erysipelas. And this is what turned Coley on to thinking that, well, what you've got to have, you have to really have the real bug there, number one. And number two, you've got to have a, a severe infection or, a, or you know, a, a real infection. Then case number five was a large sarcoma on the back. And again, injections into the back, no response. And then in, in patient number six, there was a large sarcoma on, on the back and, and also in the groin. And um, with repeated, with the first injection, again, the fever went up to 105, patient got erysipelas and the tumor shrank within 24 hours. How, and so, but he called that a partial remission. That wasn't a complete remission. And then the patient number seven, he was still treating her while, while she was, um, while he was writing this paper. And number, patient number eight, there was only a partial remission. Number nine, there was no response. And um, uh, number 10, they had to discontinue therapy because the patient was so debilitated and sick and then just went on to die. So of these first 10 cases that are in this paper that everybody quotes as being the paper about Coley and Coley's toxins, um, only one went into a complete remission. But of course, these were 100% lethal without. So that was, that was something. The, the, one of the problems that Coley recognized um, during the, all, you know, these patients were treated over a sequence of time. And what he recognized was he, he, he didn't really have a good control over his, uh, whether his cultures of the, of the streptococcal bug were really, you know, reproducibly viable and, 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 he, and he had no idea what the dose was and, and so forth. But he felt that he, and he says this in his paper, that he needed, he needed to have a clinical infection um, uh, and erysipelas and high, high systemic fever and, and systemic symptoms of malaise and so forth, or it wasn't going to work. And that's interesting from the standpoint of what he next goes on to say, so he adds at the very end of his paper, a note in, uh, in press was that there, was, uh, there were, had been reports out in the literature that the, that the toxic, the, you didn't need the live bugs. And the live bugs were sort of a little bit of a problem, as you might imagine, because you could lose the patient from the infection itself. And that wasn't such a pretty way to go either, you know, because you got really, really sick and then you died. And so there was a fellow in... Um, in Holland, in late Leiden, that had published in 1891 too, before this paper, that he had treated 26 patients with the toxins, what he what they thought were the toxins from the bugs, and and the way you made a toxin was you take you grow up your bugs in a culture in culture fluid, and then you uh, uh, the easiest way to do it was then to heat it up, boil it, heat it up to 100 degrees, um, and then. Uh, filter out, you know, the, the most of the material, and take the filtrate uh, of the um, uh, of the cultures, and that's what they call toxins. Because then, if they injected the toxins, and this is what uh, the fellow from Leiden, uh, what's his name, Spronk, he inje he didn't inject them straight into the tumor either. He injected them distal to a, you know normal part of the body, and he still got. Um, uh, uh, he reported these 26 patients um, 
and he had nearly all the patients got better transiently and some of them that he thought were cured. That's, that's the only thing that's stated in, in um, Coley's paper. But this induced him after, after he you know, had these 10 patients that he treated with live bugs. And so I get the, so you get the feeling that, you know, first of all, Coley was not the only guy that's been thinking about this stuff. There was Felicin from Germany who isolated the bug. And there's this, this fellow in um, Spronk in uh, Leiden. <clears throat> trying to do the same thing. And that is to try to, and it was all based on really uh, anecdotal cases where people had big tumors and they were under therapy by doctors. And, you know, every now and then there would be one that would got an, that would get a, an infection. And um, lo and behold, the, the severe infection, if they recovered from that, a lot, sometimes, not very often, but sometimes the tumor would just dissolve. Quite striking. So Coley decided, and he puts in at the end of his 1893 paper that he's um, that he's going to switch to the toxins, the toxic uh, products. And at the same time, he decides to to not only use streptococci, but also to add a col coliform ba bacteria um, before he makes his toxins, and you know he kills them and so forth. The coliform bacteria are very, very interesting from the standpoint of immunology, as we'll probably get into, as I know we'll get into, uh, because their cell walls uh, have a characteristic, um, are constructed of a characteristic um, molecule that's called lipopolysaccharide. Well, nowadays we know, so that's abbreviated LPS. LPS is, a, is, a, is basically the first adjuvant that was reduced to a chemical and not just a bug. Um, that, that markedly potentiates the immune response. So now Coley's using both streptococci and the coliform bacillus and making toxins and injecting tumors or distal from tumors and so forth. And so that was the beginning of his career when he was just a young guy, 29, 30, 31, uh, 32 years old. Um, and over the course of then well, he, and he recognized and other people then recognized, well, people got excited about it and they, a lot of people tried to repeat it, but there were different, there were problems. I mean, because everybody was using a different bacterial prep, probably from the microbiology department in their hospital or whatever. And so there were, um, there were, you know, you name it, there were, there were different preps being used by different doctors. They also, uh, and gave different dosages and different frequency of injections and different durations of infections. So there was no, uh, there was no standard uh, protocol for this kind of thing. But, but between 1895 and 1944, so basically that's 50 years, there were 23 other docs that had reported that, reported that they tried um, Coley's toxins by now, that's what they're called, being called. And, um, and they could re reproduce some of his, his, you know, other people had positive results too. And at the same time, Coley, Coley went on and continued to do this. And he would bring his, his cured patients to, to medical meetings and have them stand up on the stage and he'd show them a picture of what the tumor looked like beforehand. And then he would have the person there um, cured and, and so forth, but because there were not only, so there were a lot of people, there were people supporting him, but there were also people that were the naysayers. You can already, you always have these people, yeah, it's too good to be true and so forth. And I had that with interleukin too. Uh, <laughs> so um, turns out, so Coley kept on, on um, treating patients and he was using the New York hospital but at the same time, he was also going to Memorial Hospital in New York, which was a, a cancer hospital that had been established in 1888. Um, and so now it's called Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute. And it's right across the street from New York Hospital. But in those days, they were separate physically. So the skeptics said, well, you know, um, those, those probably really weren't cancer in the first place if they responded to this erysipelas coli's toxin therapy. And at the same time, other things were happening around right around the turn of the century. Um, one of the things that happened in there are two things, two or three things that happened in just immunology. Allergy was discovered with repetitive injections of things into people. 
they would get allergic reactions. And one of the worst one is called anaphylaxis. And that's what they're worried about with the COVID vaccine. They don't want you to have anaphylactic shock and die in the, in the treatment room there of the hospital when you get your shot. So they make you wait for 15 minutes before they release you. I suppose then you're walking down the street and you can still, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. So that happened. And then um, as a consequence of, of um, von Behring and Kittisanto's discovery of, ser of serum that contained these antibody activities, a whole new field in medicine uh, arose that's called serology. And the um, people that were involved in this, they were involved in it at the Pasteur and also at the Koch Institute and so forth in Germany. They would take, they started in order to get a lot of serum. They wanted to use the serum to treat the diphtheria patients and the tetanus patients because it worked. Now, the only problem was is that you could save the child, but then a phenomenon that would happen about two weeks later the, the kid with diphtheria would be fine and whatever else. And then weird things started to happen with high fevers and, um, and um, uh, kidney difficulties and so forth. And what was going on is, was, was deemed uh, serum sickness. What was going on was is that the horse serum proteins that were injected into the humans, there was an anti-horse response and then massive antigen antibody complexes were formed that clogged up the kidney and did all kinds of bad things. And so again, this is another injection of, um, uh, of people with different kinds of things. And so um, not everybody got on the bandwagon with this um, Coley's toxins therapy. And of course the patients would get sick when they would get these toxins. And so it wasn't a, wasn't a big deal or wasn't a good deal. Then the other thing that was happening right about that time in 1895, Wilhelm Röntgen discovered x-rays. And then in 1896, Henri Becquerel in, in France discovered radioactivity. And then in 1898, Paris, uh, Pierre and Marie um, Curie <coughs> discovered radium. And almost immediately, they started using radiotherapy to see if they could um, treat cancer. And consequently, what happened was is that in you know in Coley's case, you know one out of ten or one out of uh, one out of five patients might might get a very good response, but 100% of the people got the toxicity with radiotherapy. <clears throat> almost everybody's tumor shrank down, and but the, but again, you know it was. A partial response and so over time the tumors would reappear and then they would be um, ultimately would become refractory to the radiotherapy and the patient would go on and die but radiotherapy became the you know the cat's meow in the first part of the of the 20th century and coley's toxins meanwhile were sort of dwindled down then in, in the whole cancer therapy end of things, and right after the war, well, during the First World War, they'd used um, nitrogen mustard gas. The Germans had used it for, to kill the, up at the other side. One of the very first chemotherapeutic agents used in the clinic was uh, nitrogen mustard. Uh, and that happened after the World War, World war II. And then from then on in the 50s and the 60s, chemotherapy became the, the third therapy that was really established for, for cancer therapy. So you had surgery, you had radiotherapy, and you had chemotherapy. Meanwhile, immunotherapy that, that started with, with um, Felicin and Stroke and, and, <laughs> and Coley was um, forgotten, except, and this is very instructive, and except Coley's daughter, Helen Coley Knotts, N-A-U-T-S, carried the torch and she wouldn't let go. She thought her father was correct. And so she wrote a review on it. So Coley went on and died in 1936. And in 1946, just before the advent of all these um, new chemical drugs and so forth, Helen uh, Coley Knotts uh, published a long review article and, and 
basically she reviewed every case that she could find in the literature of, um, of, of people using Coley's toxins or, or something like that. And she, she got some really remarkable results. Um, she, she looked, she reported 312 cases that were inoperable treated with Coley's toxins and half of them were, were Coley's patients himself. The other half were other people. But of those 300 patients, 140, 134, 43%, almost half of those patients had a, a long-term five-year survival. But, you know, the chemotherapists didn't want to have to deal with these, this, these, this, this was, by this time, immunotherapy had gotten a very bad name. And there was a whole bunch of, of people that wanted to become the first oncologists and chemotherapists. And so that's the, the end of that story, essentially, until, and I'm gonna, we're gonna go into this later in the Journal Club, and, until Professor Georges Maté picked up where Coley left off and started using bacterial um, bacteria to treat leukemia and the Bacillus calmant guarin, which is called BCG. And we'll get into that a little bit later. So I'll stop there. So if you've enjoyed this video, um, please like, subscribe, and sign up for my newsletter, uh, where I'm serializing my new book, which is called The, the Quest for New Knowledge. You'll find a sign-up link below. Hey, thanks again. It's been great.